recording. Good morning, everyone. Yitzi is here to help me with today's shear. That's my older brother. Today is Zion Adar Shani, second Adar, March 17th. Happy birthday, Yoni Glot. Your birthday was yesterday, so we couldn't put it on the recording, but a quick recap of yesterday. We talked about the muscle that the Zaya brought, that a man is like a, fl a candle. A candle burns. The body is the wick. The head holds the flame. And the oil is our mitzvah that we do. We're trying to figure out why we have to struggle constantly. Why there's this ongoing, never-ending rat race of struggle to try to do good as the Yitzhahara keeps on trying to disturb that flow. And um, this is one of the things that the altar was getting to. So he says that a person is, the physical body is the wick. The, the flame comes on our head from, with the Shekhinah of God, the, the spiritual light of God. And the oil, the fuel for the fire is our mitzvahs, the good actions, the good deeds, etc. And uh, when you have a candle that's burning, it could be a beautiful vessel that's holding the oil. It could be a nice fiberglass wick that seems to last forever. But the fuel has to constantly be refilled. So we always have to do mitzvahs and we always have to, you know, it's not easy to get the fuel. It's expensive. If it comes from olive oil, you have to go get those olives. You have to crush it. So that's just one idea that the Alter Rebbe brought. Now today we're going to learn chapter 36. This chapter discusses the purpose of all existence. So why? Why do we have to do a mitzvah? In fact, yesterday we mentioned as well this interesting concept that God, if he could have just the mitzvahs of a Jew, he wouldn't have the world. He, all he wants is a Jew to do a mitzvah. But in order for a Jew to do a mitzvah, they have to live in this physical world. We have to eat and we have to sleep and we have to work and we have to do all those other things that seem to be really a means to an end. But the point is really for the Jew to do a mitzvah. That's what brings Hashem Nachas. Just like we go to work. And the point is not going to work and not making money. The point, the ultimate objective is to support our families, to have beautiful homes, to be able to put food on the table, to give the kids what they need, to be able to pay for tuitions, whatever that might be, right? Put aside for your retirement. It's not the actual work. Sometimes we lose track and we lose focus and we think that the work is the main thing. But of course, it's the end result, which is to be able to support our families. Right, Larry? So the same thing is true with when it comes to Kaddish Baruch Hu. He, the God has, to, God has to create the world in order to bring us to a point that a Jew is able to, able to fulfill a mitzvah. But that's not the main point, not the world, how beautiful, no matter how beautiful it is, and no matter how much we have, and no matter how much we enjoy in the physical world, all of that is just to get a Jew to the point where he is able to fulfill a mitzvah. So this chapter discusses the purpose of all existence, this idea that we were talking about, God's desire for a dwelling place in this world. And there are many other worlds as well, the spiritual worlds, but this is the world where a yid can fulfill a mitzvah. And today, the lowest realm, which we're talking about here, this world, which Hashem desires as a dwelling place, refers to our physical material world where Hashem is most obscure. Can we see God? No, not necessarily. Sometimes in our most spiritual moment of saying Shema on Yom Kippur, maybe we sense godliness. Oh, we know there's holiness in the ark, but God is hidden in this world. But this is the world. Dafka in this world is where God wants to hang out and dwell and be a part of. In the previous chapter, the Altarah began to explain why the observance of a practical mitzvah is the ultimate purpose of Torah and one's spiritual service of Hashem. This practical aspect is understood and underscored by the Pasuk that we started with the whole Tanya of Kikarav Elecha, this thing is near to you, in your mouth and in your heart that you may do it. So we, we have the ability, we have the capability of performing the mitzvah. It's near to us. He explained that only mitz, only through mitzvah observance, action down mitzvahs, action-based mitzvahs, draw down the Shekhinah, the light of the Shekhinah, upon one's animal soul rather than upon the divine soul alone, as do mitzvahs performed only in thought and speech. So we have to do the action-based mitzvahs to really transform our physical reality. Yet this does not answer one question. 
Why is the illumination of the body and the animal soul so important? Okay, we understand that we have to do a physical mitzvah in order to illuminate the physical body. But why? We still have that question. Why is that toil still so important? And why should this be considered one's primary objective? Why can't it be meditation, deep, thoughtful meditation? That is more spiritual, seemingly, right? If you're doing a physical action, putting on fill and leather straps. I mean, that's a, you know, you would think it's a good mitzvah, but delving in, internally on the, on, on trying to connect to God in your mind, that would seem much more spiritual, much more powerful, even. No. So the Altarab addresses this question in chapter 36. It's well known. It's funny. We, we were at a, a fundraising conference in Lancaster, Pennsylvania a few years ago. And the non-Jewish presenter was saying to us, what's your mission statement? What's, what, I mean, not, not for Chabad, but like, what's your, what would you say is the most important thing that you're trying to do? And I thought it was a trick question, but a lot of guys said to make a dwelling place for Hashem in this world. I'm like, stop it. You're full of it. That's, you know, so when he got to me, I said to feed my family. That's my mission statement. I want to feed my family. How do I do it? Of course, I'm, I'm glad I'm in a position to bring Yidin close to Yiddish guy, teach Taira and Mitzvah and do everything else. But we're in a fundraising session, guys. Stop with your bring them. <laughs> you know, that statement is not going to get you food on the table. But it just reminded me of that because all the Chabad rabbis are like, to bring heaven down to earth to make a dwelling place for God. Okay, that's a nice quote, but how do you do it? What's the practical application? What are we talking about here? Bringing God down to earth. Of all the years that you've been working on this, David, are we able to do it? Do we accomplish it? So according to what the Torah says and Siddha says and Kabbalah says, we do it, but are we, are we really feeling it? How to, right, Vladimir, you're smiling. Well, hey, but we're... we're how many, I don't want to say your age, but you're not you're not that young, right? You're getting old, older and wiser. Nice vice of bard. All your life, you're trying to bring God down into the world. So can we say we accomplished this? It's a very, it's a very, huh? It's an abstract concept, right? It's hard to measure. Like, we want to do good deeds. We could say, I helped somebody else. If he was poor and I helped him and I gave him money, I brought him food, but I made a dwelling place for God. Like, that seems to be, you know, the go-to. So that's what it says right here. And it's a well-known statement to rabbis declare that the purpose for which this world was created is that God, the Holy One, he desired to have an abode in the lower realms. Okay, the fact that he desires, it's great. But how do we do that? He desired that the essence of his ain't sight, this eternal light, be revealed as it is, without veil or concealment. So we haven't reached that level yet. When are we going to get there? Well, maybe they had it during the Beis Migdash times and the Holy of Holies. God willing, soon when Mashiach comes, there will be a great revelation when we have to see God. But until then, we're going to strive to reach that point. Our sages interestingly use the word abode or dwelling place to describe the revelation. Just as a man's home serves as an abode for his essence, generally speaking, you want to hang out at home. I mean, it's unfortunate, the people that want to hang out at work. Sometimes you have no choice. You're at work. To earn a living so that you can go home. That's where you really want to be. Hopefully. I was telling someone at Chavez that someone I know who eventually got divorced and remarried. Now he has another kid. But in his first marriage, he was always at work. He never, he, he, he told me himself that he barely spent time. You know, he barely saw, even on the weekends, he barely saw his kid. His kid's an adult now. But uh, he has two kids. But uh, he was speaking more about his son. Like, oh, I didn't play with him. I didn't take him. I didn't do that. It's like it was a big mistake. Yeah, I made a lot of money, but I could have been just fine making less or even half. We would have lived very comfortably and I would have raised my child. I didn't raise my child. I barely saw him. I, my wife had enough. She, I was never home. I, I used to sleep at work sometimes. And that's really missing the point. We have to be home with our families. And of course, we have to work hard to make sure to sustain and support them. So the Altareva now goes on to explain the phrase, the lower realms mentioned above. What does it mean the lower realms are trying to make a dwelling place for Hashem down here? He shows that this refers specifically to our physical world, the lower realms. Surely before Hashem, this distinction of higher and lower doesn't apply because Hashem is not bound to time and space. 
Well, what is this higher and lower? One world's not higher than the other from according to Hashem's perspective. Because Hashem fills all the worlds equally. So what do our, what do our sages mean when they say the lower worlds? Ella be Iranian. So let's explain this a little bit further as follows. Before any worlds were created, when I say like this, you know, from Hashem, there's no change. But from us, we experience a physical world, a physical life. We eat, we drink, we sleep. We, you know, we're, we're sitting at a table, we drive in our car. And even from the angels' perspective in the worlds that they live in, they feel as if independently created in the upper worlds. But before any of that was created, there was only God. Only God filled all the space. Anything that should be conceived as a space or possibility for creation was filled with only the eternal light of God. And even now came from God's perspective, nothing changed. Everything is the same. All is united with God. Just like it was prior to creation. The only change that happens and that, uh, that applies is to the recipients of the godly light and of this creation that God created. We feel independent. The angels feel independent. Everything in this world feels independent. So before creation, there was none, there was nobody and nothing around to receive the divine life force and light. But creation brought into these beings, these uh, the recipients, this life force. <speaking in Hebrew> These, us, and the entire world, let's say, who receive this life force from Hashem by way of numerous garments which veil and conceal God. We've talked about this many times. The different simsumim, the, the veils, the screens, the contractions, the different levels that hide more and more and more the light of God until we reach this world. So much so that God is completely hidden and we don't even recognize God. People say God doesn't even exist. That's how hidden God is in this world. <inaudible> so it is written, for no man can see me and live. We were talking about this yesterday, also earlier in the Tanya, in the beginning of the portion um, yesterday, how even Moshe Rabbeinu, who spent all those days up on the mountain, not eating, not drinking, not sleeping, just communicating with the Holy One, Moshe Rabbeinu couldn't, can't see Hashem. No, it, it's, you can't even say that in a sentence without like, does it make sense to, that Moshe saw Hashem, the back of Hashem, and Hashem doesn't have a head to see? Like, Hashem is everything. Our rabbis of flesh, so forget about a human being. What about the chayes, the angels? The holy chayes cannot see God, except by way of garments that conceal him, thereby enabling them to receive his light. So they may sense something, but they don't see the essence of God. That's impossible. The degree of concealments vary from world to world, from level to level. So here the distinction between higher worlds and lower realms becomes valid as the Alter Rebbe continues. So in the higher realms, the angels are closer, so they have less, God has less concealment, and they might sense God maybe a little bit more than we do, but still that's so... You know, it's so far-fetched to think that they actually experience to be able to see or experience godliness. So now we have some inkling as to what it means the higher worlds and the lower worlds. The higher worlds are the angels, that there's less concealment, and lower worlds are more concealment. So again, like using the muscle of the sun, which we've done many times, of course, we get a little bit closer to the sun. Near the equator, it's hotter, it's sweaty. My brother lives in Florida. It's always warmer there. You know, or if you, right? When you go further away, it's colder. Uh, God forbid if a person travels, you know, we talked about this numerous times. If you've heard this already, that's fine. The sun is approximately 92 million miles away, right? Or maybe exactly, 92 million miles away. Yeah, give or take a few uh, feet. But if we were 91 million miles away instead of 92 million miles away, we wouldn't exist. I'm one, only one mile closer, big deal, in the 92 million. So the closer you get, we couldn't handle it. We wouldn't be able to sustain it. But the Malachim could. Talking about spiritually, the light of Hashem. This is just to give us some kind of a perspective as to the higher worlds and the lower worlds. The angels are in the higher spiritual worlds. 
So there's more revelation in the higher worlds. That's all it is. In the lower worlds, we could not handle any revelation. I shouldn't say any. We Mostly we cannot handle it. There's little dribs and drabs when it comes to the maybe the high holy days or during the base of Migdash, as we mentioned, and God willing, but this is just to give us a perspective of the difference between the higher world and the lower. This concealment that God is concealing his light as it goes lower and lower is the subject of the Hishtalshalus, which here it translates as the chain like graded and downward succession of the worlds and their descent from level to level. Again, for those that learn to this regularly, we've, we've heard these terms over and over and over. But for the sake of this time this year, in chapter 36, if this is a new concept to you, then as the light of God comes down to the lower world, it gets more and more concealed as it goes down level to level. <speaking in Hebrew> Through all the many garments and the veils and screens and contractions, etc., that conceal the light, and the life force emanating from Hashem, the more concealment, the lower the descent. Until the culmination and the creation of this physical world. This is the lowest world. This is the lowest level. There's nothing lower than this world. In this world, God is completely concealed. There's nothing that compares to it. It's doubled and redoubled darkness. Nowhere in is God's light as hidden as it is in this world. As soon as we go up one spiritual world, and there are myriads of levels within each spiritual world, but we start going up a level, suddenly there's more revelation. So now we're at the bottom where God is completely concealed. Can we see God? Can we feel God? Sometimes in our hearts, in our minds, we feel a desire and a closeness to Hashem, but there's no revelation necessarily certainly in our generation, in our times. So we're in this low world. So much so, how low we are, that this world is filled with klipa and sitra achara, meaning all kinds of negativity and things from the other side, which actually oppose God by saying, I am and there's nothing else beside me. Let me just finish, guys. We're done. It's clear that the term lower worlds refers to this physical world, the very lowest in the degree of divine revelation. We're basically building up the case to say that God, want, why would God want to have a, an abode down here in this world where he's so hidden, where, he's so, where it's so removed from the spiritual light? So he's created that case. Tomorrow we're going to go a little bit further in why, but just to take away Understanding the purpose of creation helps us understand our purpose. To understand the whole Seder Shalshas and to understand why God wants to be revealed in this world will help us understand why we should be wanting to do a mitzvah and why we want to get closer to God through doing good deeds. So the measure states that the purpose, God desires, so to speak, a dwelling in the lower realms. Meaning God desires that from the world that looks so ungodly and unrefined, you make a place where he can call home. The culmination, obviously, the end result, the final, the final, uh, the final mission will be when Mashiach comes, and then there will be taka revelation. So, I don't know if this is a great example, but if a person is a developer and he'll go into a place where you know there's already nice homes and everything else, he can take a house, he can build a house, or he might be up for a challenge. Where he says, you know, that is a decrepit neighborhood. There's a bunch of abandoned homes you know what, I'm going to change the landscape. This is like, you know, in my backyard, meaning it's it might be the next town over, but there's a whole bunch of, you know, there's a whole number of homes that are abandoned and there's broken down and thing and there's graffiti. I'm going to come in with my crew and I'm going to clean it up. And within a few years time, within by the time 10 years go by, it's going to be the most beautiful development and it's going to lift the spirits of everybody in the neighboring communities and new people are going to move in and families. Just picture parks and sidewalks and trees and everything is so beautiful and fountains and all these other things. So if a guy is up for a challenge, if a guy just wants to make money, does his thing. But if a guy wants to change something and make a positive impact, he's going to pick the bad neighborhood where he's going to see the tremendous positive effects. I just thought of that muscle now. I don't know if it's perfect. Just like any muscle has its flaws. But anyways, Hashem wanted to take the lowest of the worlds 
So, so far, we built the case why it's the lowest of the world. We also built the case why Hashem wants to create a home for him here. And now tomorrow, we're going to continue along with this theme. Have a wonderful day and a good tevach. And don't forget, we're in Chaydesh Adar. So, Marvin Besimcha. Adarai, Adarai. Meshavet is yard side. And birthday. Adarai, Adarai. Hey, Adarai, Adarai. 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 Adarai, Adarai.